Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to number five, Chambers. Uh, this talk is called Statutory Nuisance, a Practical Guide for Local Authorities. I am Howard Leithhead, and I'm a Planning and Environment Barrister here at number five, and will be joined by Jack Smythe and Shona Davis, also on the Planning and Environment team here. Just to give you a rundown of what we will be dealing with. I'm going to start by giving an introduction, just uh, looking at what statutory nuisance is. And then most of the talk this afternoon, we'll be looking at common issues with abatement notices. I'm going to look at the meaning of prejudicial to health and nuisance, what they mean in the statutory context. And then um, Jack is going to look at, does a planning permission legalise a nuisance? Uh, the noise, when does noise become unacceptable? Then the issue of contaminated land. Sean Ed is then going to look at the, the formal requirements of an abatement notice, whether a notice should be suspended pending an appeal, and the best practicable means defence. And then finally, very briefly, Jack's going to look at the issue of injunctions. So first then, introductory, by way of introduction, what is statutory nuisance? Well, a statutory nuisance is a legislative means of providing a summary procedure for remedying a range of unacceptable matters. Most statutory nuisances will either put human health at risk or harm the immunity of neighbours. There are nine categories of statutory nuisance uh, listed here. Here's the section, the relevant section, section 79.1 of the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, the first is to do under A is to do with the state of premises. B is concerned with smoke emitted from premises. C uh, is to do with fumes or gases emitted from premises. And you'll see that uh, all are to deal with prejudicial to health or nuisance. So A is any premises in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or nuisance. And we're going to be looking at the meaning of those words shortly. And then the fourth one is dust, steam, smell or other effluvia from industrial trade or business premises. E is concerned with accumulations or deposits. F is concerned with animals. FA is concerned with insects emanating, emanating from relevant industrial trade or business premises. FB is concerned with artificial light emitted from premises. G is concerned with noise emitted from premises. GA is noise emitted from or caused by a vehicle, machinery or equipment in a street. And then H is a catch-all uh, section dealing with other matters declared by other acts to be statutory nuisances. The issues which you will most commonly deal with are noise and odour. And then at the end of the uh, section 79.1 is the duty on local authorities. It says here, and it shall be the duty of every local authority to cause its area to be inspected from time to time to detect any statutory nuisances which ought to be dealt with under section 80 below or sections 80 and 80A below, where a complaint of, of a statutory nuisance is made to it by a person living within its area to take such steps as are reasonably practicable to investigate the complaint. And section 1A is also of particular relevance uh, this sets out the first exception to the statutory nuisances provided for in section one, uh, subsection one, and this states, no matter shall constitute a statutory nuisance to the extent that it consists of or is caused by any land being in a contaminated state. And Jack's going to say a bit about that shortly. And then finally, further requirements are provided by the statutory nuisance appeals regulations in 1995. These really put the meat on the bones of, of the uh, statute of nuisance provisions. So turning then to deal with common issues with abatement notices, and the first issue is the meaning of prejudicial to health and nuisance. Prejudicial health, this is defined in the statute itself at section 79.7 as meaning injurious or likely to cause injury to health. It doesn't have to cause injury, it's enough that it's likely to do so. It's interpreted by the courts broadly, and there's a low threshold for it. Um, sleeplessness in itself may be prejudicial to health, and it's important to judge it objectively. It's based on the effect on an ordinary person, so it doesn't depend on a particular individual's characteristics. However, if you have somebody with a, a particular health condition and the issue makes it worse, uh, that is sufficient. 
prejudicial to health. If you're relying on this, it must be proven by expert evidence. Commonly, this would just be, though, a letter from a GP which first clearly identifies an ailment or diagnosis and, and then secondly attributes it to the activity. But the courts have recognised the evidence of others, such as building inspectors and environmental health officers. The second limb is nuisance. This means an unacceptable interference with the personal comfort or amenity of the nearby community. It's based on, on the idea of good neighbourliness, and, and that was uh, set out in the case of Baxter and London Borough of Camden. And a nuisance has also been defined by Lord Justice Carnworth more recently in the case of Coventry and Lawrence No. 1, as meaning what objectively a normal person would find it reasonable to have to put up with. So an authority will need to make a judgment. In making a judgment, it will want to take into account the following factors. The first is location. Famously, in the case of Sturges and Bridgman, it was said that what would be a nuisance in Belgrave Square would not necessarily be a nuisance in Bermondsey. It's important to consider the baseline. So has there been a long-standing lawful activity, such as, in, and this came up in a recent case, a loud motocross track next to a quiet village for many years? So if there has been a loud motocross track, then the baseline, the noise landscape might be higher and, and, and the baseline for what's acceptable might be, might, be, might be higher. It's also necessary to consider whether, anything, whether there's anything relevant in a development plan document. This might be in the development plan itself, or it might be in an SPD. It might just be in a, in a small part of the commentary to the, to the development plan. And anything here may assist in, in determining what the baseline is. And time of day is also relevant. So noise at night that disturbs people's sleep is likely to be looked at much less favourably than noise during the day. Similarly, noisy parties on a Saturday evenings might be viewed more favourably than those that take place during the week or and particularly on a school night. Another factor that's important is duration. An hour's instrumental practice through thinly insulated walls may well be regarded more favourably by the courts than many hours of practice taking place. Construction noise is something which commonly causes uh, complaints to the council, but the noise from temporary construction works may need to be tolerated. Informing a view on duration, usually it's just a matter of forming a common sense judgment. Uh, however, if there's a breach of covenant, uh, there's a case there, Newman and Real Estate Debenture Corps, uh, in, the, in that the court uh, indicated that that might be relevant. The next issue is persistence or frequency. So restricting the frequency of the nuisance is often at the nub of the abatement notice. So for instance, in Wilden District Council in Hollings, a farm was restricted to muck spreading 15 days of the year. Convention is also relevant. So to take the example of lawn mowers, modern lawn mowers can be really annoying. They can create a, a huge amount of noise at a time of day uh, when it's sunny outside and people will more likely want to enjoy their gardens. However, using such lawnmowers is generally accepted as conventional practice and, and, and is very unlikely to be a nuisance. The next issue is the value of the activity to the community. If it's important uh, to the community and has value, a greater degree of latitude may be afforded to the activity. For instance, noise from an industrial premises that creates a lot of jobs in the area may be viewed more favourably than a noise uh, created by a hobby that's only enjoyed by a few people. However, there will still be limits to this and uh, it can only be pushed so far. And then the next issue is maliciousness. Sometimes people will create uh, will, will, will set out to be deliberately annoying, for instance, by making a noise. If, if this happens, this is far more likely to be a nuisance. And then uh, the difficulty in avoiding the activity will be relevant. It's hard to stop children making a noise at playtime at school. So as an example, a court might be slower to accept this activity as a nuisance. However, if there's a noisy business that could easily introduce noise reduction measures, that's more likely to be a nuisance because it could be more easily avoided.
So of these two limbs, prejudicial health and nuisance, which should you go for? Well, in most cases, our advice is to go for this second limb because it's much easier to prove and you don't require any expert evidence. However, there's one caveat to that, and there's an obvious exception, and this is that it's traditionally been understood that the occupier of a premises from which the activity emanates can only claim for statutory nuisance if it is prejudicial to health. So, as an example, if tenants of a house are disturbed by the noise caused by a malfunctioning central heating, heating, system, heating system, they must demonstrate that the noise is prejudicial to health. And now I'm going to hand over to Jack, who's going to look at whether planning permissions can be said to legalise a nuisance. Excellent. Um, so the uh, Supreme Court um, uh, several years ago um, trespassed into the area of nuisance um, and clarified some of the controversies which have occupied practitioners and the lower courts. And it seems to me there are three um, important takeaways which practitioners should um, have in mind. The first is the Supreme Court made clear that um, coming to a nuisance does not provide a defence. So by way of example, um, if Howard was living in an apartment above a noisy bar, um, he um, sold that apartment to me and I then moved in and started living there and I started complaining about the noise, it wouldn't be open to the bar to say that they were there first and I ought to have known there was noise before I bought the property. So that's um, clarifying that position. Um, the second takeaway is the extent to which the defendant's own activities um, can be included when one judges what the character of the locality is. And we all know that judging the character of the locality is quintessentially a matter of fact and degree, and ultimately it's a matter of judgment for the court. What we're really concerned with is the pattern of uses um, in the local area. Um, this has been a, a perennial bugbear with different courts giving um, different views or expressing the test in slightly different ways. And in this area, the Supreme Court overruled what the Court of Appeal had said. So what the Supreme Court has found is that when a defendant is faced with an allegation of nuisance, it can rely upon those activities as constituting part of the character of the locality to the extent that they don't cause an actionable nuisance. So if you cannot carry out the activity without causing a nuisance, then that activity has to be entirely discounted. In many ways, the, court, the Supreme Court are acknowledging that um, it's a slightly unsatisfactory position, but in many ways, what the Supreme Court has opted for is what it regards as the least worst option. So to give you an example, in that case, it was a motocross stadium with motor vehicles whizzing around on the track. So what the court is saying is that when judging the character of the locality, it's acceptable to have regard to the motor racing track and um, acceptable levels of noise, but one has to strip out the unacceptable noise, which is said to give rise to the nuisance. There's an element of artifice about that, but as Lord Newberger says, that's better than the alternatives, because the alternatives is either you completely ignore and discount the defendant's activities as forming part of the character of the locality, which could be unfair to the defendant because they may have a planning permission, they've been operating for years and years and years, and it's a long-standing feature in the landscape. Or the other extreme, um, if you include all the noise, then defendants can be seen to be um, benefiting from their own nuisance because you can then factor in the nuisance and it makes it more difficult for some for a claimant to prove that um, a nuisance um, is caused. Um, and the third area where the um, Supreme Court gave guidance is on this issue about whether a planning permission can legalise a nuisance. Um, this again is a controversial um, area and unusually um, in the Supreme Court's judgment, each of the justices gave their own judgments and each of them um, articulated the test in slightly different ways. So it's not the case that this judgment entirely banishes all doubt. But I think it is fair to say that the broad outlines as to the proper approach um, have been 
articulated, but the Supreme Court was reluctant to set out any hard and fast rules. So the degree of uncertainty has diminished, but hasn't altogether disappeared. So what's the position? The position is that it is a relevant factor. So it's not a consideration one ought to um, ignore or disregard. But generally, it will be of low, no assistance to a defendant to resist an allegation of nuisance. Um, it will be of little evidential value, not least because when a planner comes to decide if a particular use is acceptable at a particular location, there are a whole host of factors at play. All the benefits, the different environmental impacts, whether it's the housing land supply, whether it's allocated in the local plan, etc, etc. And therefore, the issue as to what the likely impact will be on neighbours is but one of those issues. And therefore, it's not safe to assume that because the plan permission was granted, that it was presumed that it wouldn't give rise to a nuisance. But the exception which is um, articulated by the Supreme Court is that the existence of a planning permission can be helpful um, in circumstances where there's a condition or Section 106 agreement which stipulates the frequency, intensity or timing of a noise. So by way of example, let's say you've got um, planning permission for a factory and it says that um, vehicles can start arriving from 8.30 in the morning and there's a decibel maxima for noise emanating from the premises. Now, all of that is protected or um, restricted by means of condition. Now, a defendant would have a reasonable argument to say that that provides a starting point for um, what is reasonable for this particular use. So provided that the noise is not happening before 8.30 and provided it does not exceed the maxima, you'd have an argument to say that that is a starting point um, for deciding whether a nuisance exists um, or not. Um, judging the baseline of a locality um, by which one decides whether an activity um, gives rise to an unacceptable effect um, is a common feature of many of the appeals which um, those listing may be involved in. And I thought it might be useful just for me to draw on my own experience recently. Um, it's actually a defeat rather than a, um, a famous victory, but I was acting for a wedding venue which had been served with a noise abatement notice. Um, it um, had a planning permission, it was a long-standing venue in a village location, um, and it had um, for many years had a music licence for playing music up to 11 p.m. at night. And in response to COVID, a lot of the activity had to be exported into the gardens and grounds, which then gave rise to more um, complaints. And the argument which I articulated on behalf of the appellant was that um, the council had expressly considered whether to grant a music license. It wasn't an administrative exercise whereby you pay the fee tick a box on the online form and there you go. In this case, the local people objected and the matter was called in to the licensing committee and the members of the licensing committee heard the pros and the cons, the objectors and the applicants' representations and ultimately voted to grant a music license with particular conditions. So the argument I was making is that that issue of noise had been expressly ventilated by the licensing committee and that was a potent indication that the, the noise up to 11 o'clock was likely to be um, acceptable, but that did not find favour with the court. And the court found that um, the existence of the licence, which um, is a reasonable proxy for a planning permission, um, did not um, apply um, in the way that I suggested it did. Um, the other um, common issue um, is um, noise in respect of dwelling houses. And um, it's clear now, and it has been for over 20 years, um, that the ordinary, any use, noise, forgive me, um, from the ordinary use of a dwelling house cannot amount to a statutory nuisance, even though inadequate sound insulation may create problems for neighbours. So a statutory nuisance cannot be used as a means to encourage an ordinary householder to um, be a good neighbour and undertake sound, better sound insulation. The other common area is music. Um, generally speaking, one is concerned with the timing of the music late at night and a degree of um, persistence. 
Um, the final topic I'm going to um, address you all on um, is the issue and the interrelationship between strategy nuisance and the contaminated land provisions in the Environmental Protection Act. Um, by operation of Section 79, any harm caused or consists of land being in a contaminated state by reason of substances in or under it is not a statutory nuisance. And what constitutes stat contaminated land is then defined by the next section. Um, so land is only contaminated for the purposes of statutory nuisance if it is in such a condition by reason of substances in or under it that the land um, causes either the possibility of harm to the health of living organisms or interference with ecological systems, um, or in the case of a man includes harm to his property, or the likelihood of the entry into controlled waters of any poisonous, noxious um, or um, polluting matter or any solid waste. Um, so um, whilst there's a dual approach between statutory nuisance on the one hand and the Environmental Protection Act, which attacks contaminated land, um, there can sometimes be some overlap. So um, it's something which could be contaminated land may also be a statutory nuisance um, if it causes harm to um, the senses. Um, but land contaminated by substances dangerous to ecosystems, the health of a living creature and human property um, is not a statutory nuisance. So where does that leave us? Um, in many ways, it's much it, that sounds rather complicated. In reality, when you're faced with a problem, usually it's much more clear when you're faced with a particular um, circumstance. So um, to, to deal with various permutations, um, a pile of smelly but harmless material on the land, like manure, could be a statutory nuisance, um, but wouldn't be contaminated land, whilst a pile of odourless but deadly metal um, would be contaminated land, but wouldn't be a statutory nuisance. Um, the exception must relate to the condition or state of the land, not for the use of, to be undertaken on the land. Um, and as I said, of the two regimes, um, they can apply um, at the same time in certain circumstances. And that brings my part of the talk to a close and I'll now pass you on to the next stage. Thank you, Jack. I trust that you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Shauna Davis. I'm going to be dealing with the do's and don'ts of abatement notices and some common pitfalls um, that you as local authorities should be seeking uh, to avoid. I'm going to deal with three main areas. The first being the requirements of an abatement notice. Um, secondly, whether a notice should be suspended where there is an appeal. And thirdly, the best practicable means defence, which is the defence that most recipients of an abatement notice will be seeking uh, to rely upon. Dealing firstly then with the uh, requirements of an abatement notice and, and what indeed we're, we're trying to abate. Um, there are two approaches, two common approaches which you can use um, when drafting an abatement notice. The first is a more generic catch all phraseology linked to use, that is to say, um, you're going to cease the use, for example, um, the noise. Or secondly, you can use um, a more specific, uh, specific wording requiring the recipient to do something, for example, requiring that they install a particular form of insulation to prevent the noise um, from uh, permeating from building. Um, the next question we often get asked is, well, how specific do we need to be? And um, that has been dealt with by the courts in the case of Falmo, uh, Falmouth sorry, and Truro Port, a southwest water case, um, where they said two useful things, really. The first was that it was open to the local authority to serve the notice simply requiring abatement of the noise. It doesn't need to require abatement of heavy rock music, for example. They don't really need to be any more specific than that. Um, and it was sufficient for the notice to simply require the abatement of noise um, without specifying the particular types um, of levels of the noise. So you don't need to refer to um, decibels, for example, you just need to, to abate um, the noise itself. You'll see then that local authorities are, to give it, are given quite um, a large degree of flexibility um, in drafting the abatement notice. <clears throat> 
Um, other important points to consider um, include not mixing the two approaches. So it would be advisable not to mix the generic approach, um, abatement of the noise, and mix that with um, the more specific requirements, for example, um, the imposition of insulation. In effect, choose one or the other. That makes it much clearer uh, for the recipient of the notice. Um, if you do go down the specific uh, specific requirements, for example, requiring the installation of insulation, then you must specify the steps that need to be taken in order to, for the recipient to discharge their duty. So um, be really clear about what um, about what is needed. Sorry, I should have moved on. Um, be really be really clear about what is needed um, and avoid providing them with a menu of options, which otherwise uh, might be quite confusing. Um, thirdly, make sure um, you're clear, um, but you don't need to be as clear as a, as a builder specification. For example, you just need to um, you just you just need to be um, clear to, to the layman, as it were. Um, fourthly, try and avoid um, a requirement to just comply with the requirements um, of the environmental health officer. That's not really helpful to anyone, um, but. In the round, um, it, it, it basically abatement no notices should be read in the round um, and the courts have given a degree of benevolence to local authorities on this point. They, they don't really look um, favourably upon overly semantic attacks on um, particular uh, requirements of an abatement notice. They must be read as a whole. Um, some, some further helpful points, I hope. Um, you must state the kind of nuisance. So for example, while you, you don't need to be overly specific, you must state what the kind of nuisance is. So you must state whether it's noise, whether it's smoke, whether it's fumes, whatever it might be, you really do need to give um, an indication what the kind of nuisance is. Um, you don't need to say which activities are causing the nuisance. You just need to refer to the type of nuisance itself. Um, and whilst it would be sensible to refer to the language of reasonable or unreasonable, given that comes from the legislation, and um, the courts have interpreted those requirements rather liberally. Um, and if you use, for example, words such as unacceptable, then that's deemed um, to be um, appropriate. Um, but again, we would encourage you to, to stick to the language um, of the Act if, if you can. The second main area I'm going to address you on then is whether um, you should suspend the effect of an, info of, a, of an abatement notice pending an appeal. So when an appeal is made around an abatement notice, um, you may be left with a few questions about whether you should suspend its um, effects. And there are three main reasons where notices should be temporarily suspended. Um, those three are firstly, um, where the nuisance is injurious to health. So obviously there's a higher degree of sympathy that the courts take with nuisances which are impacting people's health um, rather than just being um, an inconvenience, so to speak. So if there is an, um, a, a case that this is injurious to health, then um, it, it may be wise to consider uh, keeping the abatement notice um, in force. Secondly, um, where the abatement notice is only likely to be uh, for a limited duration um, and a suspension would render it eff effectively um, of no practical um, implicate uh, no practical effect at all, then that might also be um, a factor where you might consider not suspending um, the uh, abatement notice too. Thirdly, um, where the expenditure of the works would not be disproportionate to the public benefit. In other words, it, it doesn't really cost that much to fix it. So why would you why would you suspend it where it, it would otherwise not um, uh, where the kind of the balance falls in favour of um, the public benefits from uh, suspending the particular activity? Um, if if you as local authority take the decision not to, to suspend um, not to suspend the notice pending an appeal, um, there are a few things um, which you should do. Um, firstly, you should state with reasons on the face of the notice why you have not suspended it. Um, that's obviously so so people are aware of the reasons um, for your decision. Um, and secondly, you can write to the recipient of the notice, giving them the opportunity. Um, while you're not suspending the notice um, and inviting them to make representations um, as to why the notice um, should indeed be suspended pending an appeal. OK, moving then to the third main topic, which is the best practicable means defence. 
And this is the defence which is most commonly used by recipients of abatement notice notices. Um, in essence, it's um, a defence which says that you've done um, all that you can do within within your means to abate to abate the notice. Um, it should be remembered that the burden is on the defendant, um, i.e. the recipient of the notice and not the local authority to demonstrate on the balance of probabilities why all other means are not uh, practicable. And that was set out in the Grantham case, with the full citation on the slides. Um, this is a, um, a, a defence which is actually defined in the Act itself. So um, the meaning of practicable is set out at section 79 9a. And it means reasonably practicable, having regard, um, among other things, so non-exhaustively, to the local conditions and circumstances, uh, to the current state of technical knowledge, and indeed to the financial implications. Um, and while consideration of alternatives may be relevant, those uh, may not be decisive. Uh, means is also defined in the Act. Uh, they're defined in Section 79.9b. Um, and this can be understood to be the means um, to be employed, including the design, the installation, the maintenance and manner and periods of operation of plant and machinery and the design, uh, construction and maintenance of buildings and structure, uh, stru buildings and structures. Um, in other words, uh, the phrase is a really broad one um, and a noisy air conditioning unit being on the quietest, uh, being the quietest one in the market uh, may not be enough. Uh, there are some further limits uh, which are provided for in the Act too, under uh, sub paras C and D. Um, obviously, the test uh, doesn't require only requires you to do what you're required to do with uh, within within the realms of the law, and can't require you to do anything that health and safety regulations would prohibit. So, some practical tips then about what you should do um, if you're relying on the best practicable means defence. Um, so the letter before notice is, is um, advisable to send. Um, that basically indicates that you're going to serve notice in due course um, and the proposed recipient should be given an opportunity to respond and to provide evidence of their best practicable means. Um, and that helps just to avoid um, protracted correspondence between the parties. Um, in that response, they should be invited to refer to any technical literature which might support their case that this is the best the best practicable um, approach that they, they could be using and um, give examples of best practice uh, used elsewhere or practice used elsewhere, which is acceptable. Finally, then, for me, um, the case of uh, Bar and Biffa um, is, is useful on this point. Mr Justice Coulson said that the legislation made plain that the use of the land would be criminal um, unless the operator of the site was acting in accordance uh, with a valid permit. And the judge said that a similar position would um, exist in respect of statutory nuisance too. Um, the omission of smell um, could be pursued by the local authority as a statutory nuisance. So you, it did give rise um, to the prospect of um, applying for a statutory nuisance, um, but um, it would then be open to the waste services company to argue that it had done everything it could. It used the best practicable means to counteract the effects of that nuisance. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Jack. Thanks. Um, so the final uh, topic from us is um, injunctions. Um, and for those of you who don't know, an injunction is an instruction from the court which contains a penal notice. So if you do not obey the injunction, um, you can go to prison for contempt of court. So it's a very strong remedy and it's one which um, can be used particularly for the more serious cases. Um, it seems to me that um, an injunction of this sort is likely to be granted by the court, because in many ways, when one um, gets to that stage, um, the defendant has exhausted all their remedies because the council have investigated and they've served a notice, there's been an appeal, the notice has been upheld. So by the time the matter comes for injunctive proceedings, in all likelihood, you are many, many months after the first complaints were received. And given that the issues have already been thrashed out and the merits of the notice determined, in the council's favour, uh, it seems to me that most judges would be sympathetic to um, the court granting that sort um, of relief. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the power is found in section 81. 
Um, so the council can go for an injunction if it considers that prosecution would represent an inadequate remedy. And the prosecution is a summary only offence. And I think the maximum fine is £5,000. So if it's a business which is generating a huge profit from some noisy activity, they may well accept that fine as an occupational hazard. So um, there may be circumstances where there's significant harm being caused um, and it's derived from profit uh, that, the, that the council would, be, would consider that prosecution would be an inadequate remedy. The claim has to be issued in the High Court. So that's a difference with planning injunctions. So if you've got a breach of planning control, you can either issue in your local county court or go to um, the um, High Court. And what's the procedure? It's very similar to planning injunctions. So you need a partake claim form, um, um, which is accompanied by a witness statement from the officer who will need to append the abatement notice, provide the evidence um, which shows that the notice is not being obeyed and also explain what real harm is caused. Because plainly, if you've got a situation where you've got a breach of an abatement notice, but it's all fairly marginal and it doesn't appear to give rise to any significant harm, the court may form the view that it's not proportionate to grant an injunction. If, on the other hand, it's a case where it's a noisy premises and people living nearby are struggling to sleep and they're having to you know, go and stay with friends or um, stay in hotels and so on, that, that would be um, a very potent reason for why the court would want to um, intervene. And the final slide uh, addresses some of the other advantages or things to note. So firstly, you can't go for an injunction until after you've served um, an abatement notice. That's another difference of planning injunction. So a planning injunction, you don't have to await service of enforcement notice or a stop notice. You can go ahead and seek an injunction, usually to restrain an anticipated breach. Um, so that's one difference. And the other benefit for this breed of injunction is um, the best practical means defence does not apply. And that's usually, as has been mentioned, the strongest card in the appellant's hand because they have to show on the balance of probabilities that they're doing all they possibly can to uh, mitigate the impact. But the BPM does not apply in injunctive proceedings. So in that respect, the court looks at the abatement notice on its face and doesn't try to go behind it. Um, so that means, and it strengthens the hand of the council. So it means if you've done all the hard work and won an abatement notice appeal, then you know that's the difficult task. And it'd be much easier, I think, in the vast majority of cases to satisfy the court to grant an injunction. Um, and that brings our uh, talk to a close. Um, I think we've still got 90 people are on there. I'm not sure if there's any questions which people have. Um, it probably makes sense to post it on the Q&A and &A, then we'll see whether we can help at all. So um, Alison asks whether the local authority um, is taking their pre-action correspondence. So if the council's been written to and the appellant has explained that there is noise but um, the best practical means are being used to control that. Um, whether that is grounds for not issuing a notice or can it only be raised on appeal. Um, I don't actually know the answer at the top of my head because I, th I think what the question is getting at is that there's no residual discretion. If the council satisfies there's a nuisance, they have to serve a notice. The question then is, well, if the council does think it's BPM, then they are implicitly acknowledging that an appeal would be successful. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure, I said in many ways it doesn't matter in the sense that um, the, the end result is likely to be the same. Um, does Howard or Shannad have any views? No, I think that's great, Jack. Yeah, I, I agree too. <laughs> I don't think it's a clear cut case, but ultimately goes to the prospects on, on an appeal. So um, whether you'd likely to be successful and that's ultimately a decision for you as a local authority about whether you want to pursue proceedings or not. Yeah. So I think Jack, the next question is from Sonia. I don't know if can you see the questions in the Q and A. Yes. So the next question is um, whether the BPM defence is limited to commercial only, or can it also include private residential? Um, the answer is no. It can be used for anything. So any statutory nuisance um, attracts a BPM defence. Shall I take this next one from Gary? Um, 
he said that I mentioned there was a low bar for proving prejudice for health. Could I outline the level of evidence in, in general terms? Well, well just, just in, in, in general terms, typically what you'd get, uh, Gary, is just a letter from a, a GP. And, and what I um, said was that just to identify what the uh, ailment is, what the diagnosis that's been given, and then um, also set out how uh, the nuisance or how the activity complained set out how the ailment um, or diagnosis is attributed to the activity. So how the activities caused the problem. And, and usually that's that that's enough. So a, a GP less is quite quite commonly uh, used. The, the, the court doesn't tend to require uh, very much more than that. Um, but it's also it doesn't have to be a, a GP. There's there's various cases on this. It might be an environmental health a building inspector, but but most often it just a, a GP's letter is enough. Um, next, there's a question. Um, forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly. It's by uh, Faisal Hajat, and and they ask, does anybody in the panel have any experience? using the shortened version of Section 80 in a Section 76 Building Act, 1984. I'm afraid I, I don't, but I'm- No, 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 no. no. So, sorry um, yeah. about that, um, Faisal. And then um, um, somebody uh, who's anonymous asks, if noise is created by a charity or a church, for example, on the street, um, but no actual premises, how would you word the abatement notice to cover various areas? I'm not quite sure I quite follow that. Um, so if it's noise created by a charity or church on the street, but no actual premises, how would you word the... I think... Oh, so if it's a sort of church activity on the, that's, that's taking place outside the church, how would you... Yeah, like a loud, loud band in the street, say. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming, Jack. If, uh, do, do, do you have any advice on that? Um, let, me, um, let me have a think about it. I'll um, get back to you. Like okay, we'll come back to, to to that then. Does any are there any other questions? For any words? you could also raise your hand, uh, I think, and ask a a question. But I think I think the Q and A is better. There's also the chat. Peter Rogers says, um, "Hello, should an abatement notice of dust from a building site be specific as to where the dust is coming from? This dust may be deemed a natural event on a construction site." And should the notice state excessive dust? Um, I think what I would what say about that, Peter, is, is to be as precise as you possibly can. Um, it, you may just have to state excessive dust. The, the difficulty that I can foresee with that is that it would be difficult to prove what, what was excessive dust and, and, and what was regular dust from a construction site. Jack, Jack may have some more thoughts on that. No, 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 I agree. Um, and I think I also got the answer for our anonymous attendee about the example about the church band being on the street. I don't think the council could serve an abatement notice because I think the statute requires noise from premises. And so if you're um, playing a trumpet very loudly um, walking down the street, I don't think that is captured. But there's other powers available to councils. So we've got the, um, the antisocial behaviour legislation, which allows for um, community protection notices to be served and in extremis the antisocial behaviour um, injunction. So I think um, in that respect, that would be a better port of call than an abatement notice. Sean, sure, no, sorry, I've not um, asked you, is there anything you want to say about any of these points? Um, no, it's fine. I was just also checking the point that, that Jack, was, Jack was mentioning. And it does say noise emitted from the premises, and that might that may be construed widely. Emitted from may not mean, you know, em emitted could mean, um, you know, as associated with perhaps. But um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think Jack's right. It's, it's um, quite closely tied to from the premises, um, nonetheless, in, in the statute at least. Uh, another question from Mark Lane. Ross, is there any environmental legislation that limits light spill either in Lux or Candela that could be used in a planning condition to help with a nuisance? I, I have to say nothing springs to mind from my point of view. Does anyone else, has anyone else encountered this? No, I haven't. No. 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 
Um, there's a question from Jamie um, about um, if you've got any thoughts on intermittent smells from manufacturing processes um, and how bad does the smell have to be and how frequently. Um, that's the main difference between smells and noise, because noise much more better lends itself to objective quantification by decibel readings and all the rest of it, whereas smell um, is entirely or in very large part subjective. So um, it's uh, in a way it's a bit easier because it's it's more difficult for the council to be criticised because if an officer expresses a view that in their opinion the smell is so bad that it's a nuisance, then it's difficult to um, gain say that with any great degree of force. Um, I mean, as you said, I mean, if it, it, it really depends how frequently and how long it lasts. I guess you could have a small a, a smell which only persists for a small period of time, but it's utterly putrid and causes your eyes to water or throw up. You know, that would be that could be a nuisance, um, could well be a nuisance. But generally speaking, it's um, smells which persist for a long period of time. It's a smell which only lasts a few minutes. That probably wouldn't be a nuisance if it wasn't putrid. I think I've also um, got in mind that Wilden District Council case in Hollings that I mentioned, where they restricted the muck spreading to 15 days a year. So it depends on, on, on what the manufacturing process is. I mean, it may not be um, possible to, to restrict it to specific days, but, but I think it's a, a common sense judgment is going to be required and, and, and it's going to involve some discussion with them about, about what, what can and can't, can't be achieved. Um, are there any other? Yeah, Sorry, Gideon. Gideon's asked asked a question, um, which I think vanished off our open question screen, but I've found it again now. So, he, um, it says, "Can you say some more about the defence that the nuisance cannot reasonably be avoided, and how is this defined?" So, I think, um, um, Gideon, I, I, I'm just trying to um, just to say a, a, a bit a bit more about it. Well, I think. Um, what you need to think about then is well what measures could be put in place that would uh, solve the problem so if there's a, uh, a manufacturing process emitting a smell for instance or a noise that's typically where, where we happen if they could easily put in pleasure and easily put in measures which would uh, reduce the smell or the noise or, or, or whatever the activity is uh, then, then that's a factor which which will be taken into into account. Um, so, 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 if they could easily reduce the the, the measures, uh, then, um, then, then, then it's more likely to be a nuisance. Uh, the the example, the other example I gave was to do with school children. Well, it's just not you know you can't um, uh, put muffle you can't muffle the children uh, e e easily. So, so a court's going to be less um, willing to accept that that is a. Uh, uh, a, a nuisance. I, I hope that answers your question. Please come back if it if it doesn't quite. I think also, I think Howard. I think um, the other point, perhaps, to make is that making an analogy with a planning enforcement notice. So, a enforcement notice cannot require a step which requires the consent of a third party. Um, so, I think maybe the difficulty might be that if a step in an abatement notice requires getting some permission from another party at the council. And that could be problematic. I guess it really depends on the extent to which one has to be explicit on the face of the notice that you do require the permission um, of, as said, that um, third party. Um, I would also just take this um, opportunity to thank David Foster, um, who's shown us all up by drawing attention to um, Section GA, which makes exact um, provision for noise from equipment in the street. So I was quite wrong to say you had to rely upon the CPN. You can, of course, rely upon a different part um, of the Act, which relates exactly to this kind of street noise. So I'm sorry for that. But of course, if there, there is, um, we can just check the um, section that, uh, that that is if it's if if it's equipment. I think there was an issue about whether it. You know what you do if 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 it's not equipment. I, I think we'd probably need to consider the specific circumstances there. So it's, so section GA says noise that's prejudicial to health or a nuisance and is emitted from or caused by a vehicle, machinery or equipment in a street, um, or or in Scotland a road. Uh, so um so I think it would depend on the particular circ circumstances and 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 we need to think about those a bit more. 
Yeah, I guess it would depend if you had the example of a little band of people playing instruments. What would one characterize um, a range of musical instruments as a form of equipment? I mean, I mean, really, what the act's getting at is loud diggers and stuff, yeah, signs and digging up um, the the um, broadband um, wires and all the rest of it. That's really what they're getting at. It's whether one can adopt a broad approach and stretch the meaning of equipment to include the musical instruments and I think it's probably arguable I don't I'm not sure if equipment is defined um, I don't well, it's not defined in this particular act as to whether one interprets it narrowly or um, broadly thanks and there's another question here which somebody emailed in advance um, forgive me I can't remember who that was um, but the question was does the shift towards home working affect the sensitivities of the man on the Clapham omnibus by which they mean the ordinary person. So uh, would, would, would noise be um, um, more likely to cause a nuisance, I suppose, if, if, if people are working at home? It's, it's a really good question. I think the answer is possibly, uh, but it would depend a lot on the, um, on this, uh, on the circumstances. Um, but, it's, but, it, but it's something that, that, that may well arise. I think you would need to take a, a judgment on, on, on the particular facts of the circumstances, what the, what the, what the noise was. Um, and um, and and whether somebody's working at home, um, and 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 the particular area and thing. I, I think if somebody's practiced their trombone for an hour a day, um, every day for ten years, and then somebody's working at home, I, I, I'm not sure you could ask them to stop playing their their trombone. But it's certainly a factor that I think people would take into mm. account. Sean and Jack may may have a view on this as well. Yeah, I think it can probably be thrown into the mix of factors which you outlined, um, Howard, I mean, in, in the table, which people may recall, including you know, location, for example, time of day, um, duration, persistence. All of those are, are, are also factors which you know, the courts have already said are, are relevant and may indeed be um, may, may indeed be also be relevant to the question of um, impacts of people working from home. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure whether we've already dealt with this one, but what would your views be on a, on a step the recipient of a notice must take, including implementing a policy or procedure for preventing recurrence of a nu nuisance, with this needing to be approved by the council? Is this a reasonable step to require, bearing in mind the qualifications of environmental officers? Yeah, I, th I, I did um, make a comment about, about drawing an analogy with the planning enforcement notice. That enforcement notice can't require a step which you don't have full power to do if, you, if it requires permission of the third party. Um, so I guess by analogy and abatement notice, it'd be better if it wasn't worded in such a way that it requires the permission of the council. And I'm sure you could probably be creative in how you draft a notice so it's not written in that way. also got a question from Chris Selby which says uh, regarding noise from gas operated bird scarers could a notice refer to the NFU code of practice as a specification um, for abatement it seems that that might be one means of um, an industry accepted means of abating um, abating a nuisance so yeah uh, probably I would say uh, the other thing you can do um, is um, just have the abatement notice saying thou shalt abate the nuisance and then have the covering letter giving um, suggested means. So rather than necessarily referring to the NFU code of practice on the face of the abatement notice, that could be in the accompanying letter, potentially. Because the, the code of practice could change as well. That's, that's the other thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. I think we're probably out of time now. I think that's yes it's after after three o'clock it's very good well i said it's very good to see everyone of course we can't see anybody but um thank you very much for 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 joining us um it's, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you we, a couple of people have asked about the slides we, we can certainly send these slides out to to everybody thank you very much for taking up an hour of your afternoon to be with us bye thank you everyone bye now